Chapter Four: The Control of Life. On September the tenth, nineteen sixty-five, Life magazine began a series of articles on the quote, "control of life," end quote, continued through September the seventeenth and twenty-fourth, and concluded on October the first. The articles proclaimed an ostensible quote, biological revolution, end quote, and the cover of the first issue announced that quote, audacious experiments promise decades of added life, super babies with improved minds and bodies, and even a kind of immortality. End quote. The goal of this quote, biological revolution end quote, is the scientific predestination of man. Scientists are clearly predestinarians today. But it is not predestination by God which they affirm, but predestination by the scientific social engineers. These men can, they believe, very soon quote foreordain and quote their children's intellect and physical characteristics quote, and of all the generations that follow end quote. The aim of present experimentation is quote nothing less than the control of life end quote. According to Dr. Kermit E. Krantz, by control of the fetal development, quote, maybe we can turn mediocrities into Einsteins. End quote. The articles themselves are meagre reading, almost entirely limited to picture captions and accompanying notes. They read like a press agent's ballyhoo and could be easily dismissed as hyperbole except that the experiments cited are at times more audacious than the writer's imagination. One caption reads, quote, Plant experiments stir speculation that man might reproduce while bypassing sex, end quote. Artificial insemination of animals is described, transplants of the embryo to uteruses of other kinds of animals, then the further transplanting into a herd of the original animals. Dr. E.S.C. Hafetz, quote, sees no reason why his techniques could not be applied to people, end quote. For future space travel, we are told that planets can be colonized by a competent biologist with test to embryos of, quote, people, cows, pigs, chickens, horses, anything we wanted, end quote. The marvels of the new biological revolution are glowingly described, quote, a man without kidneys gets one in transplant, gift of life from the dead, end quote. In the description of the transplant of animal organs to humans and the organs of one man to another, we are reminded that, while success is in the offing, the problem of, quote, tissue rejection, end quote, has yet to be overcome to make the experiment successful. This problem the scientists expect to overcome fairly soon, quote, an era of rebuilt people, end quote, by means of, quote, man-made and transplanted organs, end quote, is already visualized. This assurance is so great that the concluding section, written by Albert Rosenfeld, is entitled, quote, The New Man, What Will He Be Like? End quote. We are asked, quote, Will man direct his own evolution? End quote. The creation of life as a national goal has been urged by Dr. Charles C. Price, President of the American Chemical Society. By breaking and controlling the genetic code, man will be able to remake man. Quote, when that time comes, man's powers will be truly godlike. He may bring into being creatures never before seen or imagined in the universe. He may even choose to create new forms of humanity beings that might be better adapted to survive on the surface of Jupiter or on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, end quote. Rosenfeld is so sure that this time shall come that he devotes his major attention to the moral issues which this, quote, biological revolution, end quote, will raise. Quote, which men will we assign to play God, end quote. Quote, no one would argue that man couldn't stand some improvement, but having the actual power to do so presents some sticky choices. Who is it that we will appoint to play God for us? Which scientist, which statesman, artist, judge, poet, theologian, philosopher, educator, of which nation, race or creed, will you trust to write the specifications to decide which characteristics are desirable and which are not? End quote. The scientists are already playing God. 
Dr. Hafez's quote, egg implantation techniques, end quote, will soon be applied to the human ova by Dr. James L. Burks of the University of Chicago. We're entering an era, Rosenfeld assures us, quote, when virgin births may become relatively common, end quote. Will the family survive the biological revolution, Rosenfeld asks, quote, do we want it to survive, end quote, and if so, how, end quote, what will we substitute for it, end quote, will marriage survive, and traditional morality? We are reminded that Professor Robert C. W. Ettinger, a physicist, sees quick freezing of bodies and later rejuvenation and revivification as a coming reality. So sure is Rosenfeld that this, quote, biological revolution, end quote, is upon us, that he regards the basic issue to be the preparation of men's minds and thinking to receive this new world of, quote, scientific humanism, or, quote, evolutionary humanism. Quote, Apart from meeting these, theological questions, theologians will bear a major responsibility to adapt codes of ethics and standards of value to an age where even the eternal verities are considered open to challenge. Scientists themselves are, meanwhile, trying hard to build their own codes and standards out of logic and scientific knowledge. The growing movement is called scientific humanism, or sometimes evolutionary humanism. Influential on it have been such figures as the late French Jesuit scientist philosopher Pierre Daillard de Chardin and Sir Julian Huxley, who has outlined his version of scientific humanism in a book called Religion Without Revelation. Many biologists are hopeful that the revelations of biology itself will give us new and profound insights into the true nature of man, allowing us to draw up laws and ethical systems that are consistent with nature. The new man science helps create may also be much better equipped to deal with problems that now look insoluble, and the new powers we get may give us answers we cannot now predict, or may render some of the problems obsolete. So, even at a time when the daily newspapers are full of wars and riots and murders, and we despair that, quote, human nature, end quote, can never be different, let us not give up hope yet. Quote, can the Ethiopian change his skin, end quote, asks Jeremiah, quote, or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil, end quote. If it suddenly turns out that the Ethiopian and the leopard and you and I can change anything it pleases us to change, then it follows, does it not, that even we may also do good, end quote. Man will change his nature and will then be able to do good because he, the new God by virtue of his biological revolution, will be good in all that he does. His will shall be ipso facto good. Quote, we can guarantee that good will be done only by looking to it ourselves. End quote. Quote, the time ahead is wild and uncharted, end quote, and only man can chart the way. The presuppositions of this scientific humanism are evolutionary. For the evolutionary faith, there are no fixed boundaries in creation, only an evolutionary merging of one form into another. As a result, the line between man and the animals is not a fixed one. Organs can be transplanted, embryos transplanted, and the genetic code used to make man into a new creature. The whole position, however, rests on an illusion. Tissue rejection is a major roadblock to success for these scientific dreamers. The body rejects foreign organs, foreign grafts and works to destroy them. Man is a distinct creature, separate from all others, and all men have a biological individuality. Everybody has a powerful defence system against invaders, whether disease-bearing bacteria or viruses. The body cells, some 50 trillion, are all concerned with rejecting any invader. The blood's phagocytes also work to destroy the invader. Scientists have found this process of rejection so strong that, under a microscope, it is very apparent to the eye of the observer. But it must be noted, quote, 
Rejection of foreign sales is not the only barrier to transplant surgery. Drugs, x-rays, even certain diseases can suppress the immune response and the graft will seemingly tick unless a paradoxical mechanism comes into play in which the graft turns on its host and begins rejecting the body in which it has been placed. This reaction has been called runt disease, a name coined by Dr. R. E. Billingham, one of the great modern transplant scientists, for the wasting effect it produces in the host animal. End quote. By means of radiation, the body's resistance to foreign cells can be subverted. Low energy radiation can destroy the blood's immunity to foreign bodies and make transplanting possible. This method, however, resulted in two problems. First, this destruction of immunity meant that there was no resistance to disease. The transplant would work for a time, but the host body eventually died of some ailment, as sniffles, for example, became a killing pneumonia because no immunity remained. Second, radiation, unless lethal, only temporarily, quote, knocked out the rejection response, end quote. Drugs have been used to produce the same effect, but again, quote, the individual is left defenceless in an environment suddenly fraught with menace. But until someone finds a way to suppress only the response to the transplant antigen, the drug is the best hope for a successful transplant. End quote. Experiments with immunization by means only of cells from donor animals are regarded as a more hopeful alternative. All these attempts have one thing in common an evolutionary presupposition. According to Genesis 1.24, God made, quote, every living creature after his kind, end quote, instead of an open frontier leading from one living creature to another, all merging upward and downward, all creatures are created by God after their kind, with relationships based on a common creator and individualities based on being particular and specific creations. The attempt of evolutionary surgery to deny the distinctiveness of creatures or to overrule this individuality is doomed to fail. The experiments work against life rather than with it and for it. For scientific experimentation to work in favour of life requires a respect for life in all its forms as God made it. The present efforts attempt to thwart approaching death by techniques which ensure death. They involve the presupposition that man can become his own god and recreator and can also remake his own universe. We can agree with life that these are, quote, audacious experiments, end quote, but the ostensible, quote, biological revolution, end quote, is instead a scientific blind alley.